really delighted to have a brief moment here speaking to her today. It's actually the first time I've ever seen her talk. I know of her work, which um, I'm really really good to see it. Um, or he gets many things, but I think behavioral economists, she's one of the world's leading behavioral economists with specialization in finance. Uh, kind of, you know, finance is an entity in the real world and finance in people's lives and kind of how they think about risk and so on. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm just learning, as you, many of you know, about the economics myself right now. I'm still kind of puzzled about what it is. Is it kind of a, is it like physics, a mathematical description of some things that happen out there necessarily? Is it about psychology? Is it about how people think and react? And, or is it some blend of that? And, um, you know, perhaps different people in economics have different points of view on that, but certainly there's a bridge between those perspectives that we'll see going forward. So I've encouraged Ulrika to be uh, uh, sort of uh, open and uh, you know, informal. There are questions, you know, when you want to interact. That's more the econ model where you jump in and you argue vociferously about something. You can do that if you choose, or do the more CS model where you make the questions. Again, um, so Ulrich, I, I, there's a long bio which I won't go through that you can see uh, in the announcement. Um, but she's been here like since 2006, if I remember right. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. And originally at Bonn mm -hmm. in law and economics, and law and business. Well, so I did kind of mathematical economics and I did law. And my first PhD is actually in ancient Roman law. So if anybody wants to talk about that, <laughs> happy to do that too. <laughs> And then I, you're a professor uh, also at Harvard and, and Stanford. Uh, professor at Stanford, but yeah. Stanford, yeah. Okay, anyway, an interesting intellectual editor. So I won't take any more time. Please have a good time. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for the lovely introduction and super great to be here. As, as, as Mike knows, I have been super intrigued by the increasing links between econ and CS. And, and sometimes the students have been leading the way. I've always been working with like math econ students until a couple of years ago. And now the exciting students come from CS econ and I'm having to write you know, letters for grad school application to CS, which, you know, of course, I'm trying to turn around to go come back to econ, but it's, 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 it's really wonderful to see these connections um, uh, get closer and tighter and tighter. And so today, today I want to talk about this um, research agenda about what we're calling experience effects. I'm going to be using long lasting effects of, of crises and other big events in our lives as, as an example. And um, I'm gonna start with a somewhat maybe dry, but big picture uh, introduction, and then we're gonna become uh, much more concrete in a second. As Mike said, so I prepared enough slides so I can keep talking and typically keep talking at increasing speed with increasing German accent until like uh, 11.55, but please feel free to kind of jump in and interrupt me anytime. So, in economics, um, you know, we are in the business of predicting people's behavior and um, on the way to that, we want to understand their beliefs about, um, you know, realizations about um, um, stochastic variables. And traditionally, you know, we've been fully in love with kind of the, the Bayesian model, um, um, typically assumed that humans have perfect cognition, um, are able to do perfect information updating. And then, so all the interesting stuff came from information. Oh, there's information asymmetry. Do I have access information or do you not have access? If I, I have access to information you don't have, I may not want to share it with you. So all the whole, the contract design, mechanism design, you know, parts of, of game theory, throwing in information asymmetry, right? That's what we have been doing for 20, 25 years. And so whenever we observe some kind of behaviors, I mean, some outcomes say, take the fame, famous lemons uh, problem you've probably heard about our former colleague George Arkalov won the model, model uh, Nobel Prize for there the car seller doesn't reveal the information about who with the car is they they are they're they are trying to sell and as a result the buyer anticipates that and knows he's kind of trying to oversell the car and the market breaks down so kind of the remedy to this type of situation is well if we could only improve access to information or have a little bit better mechanism designed to reveal information so right that's kind of the traditional emphasis in in economics. Then people um, which call themselves behavioral economists came around and tried to bring in a little bit more, in some sense, insight from social psych. So acknowledging that if you want, um, there are like some flaws in our software of what we, how we update information. Some of the puzzles of markets not working out or us drawing wrong, wrong inferences may not come from information asymmetry or incentives not to reveal information. We might have all the information, but we just don't process it exactly in the, the perfect cognition way. So we draw, may draw too much inference from recent information, or we may not include, um, so David Leibson, 
Marvard has this natural expectations for a uh, model, uh, which is saying we're not including enough lags when, when we're trying to kind of come up with the best prediction of future realizations. I've worked on overconfidence, people being too confident and you know, the outcomes they have influence on um, actually uh, working out. And so this uh, strand of, um, be, of, of economics brought some kind of frictions into the process, which are not about access to information or biased incentives, but that we are processing them in a flawed manner. There's some kind of imperfect um, um, cognition. And what I'm going to talk about today, you could in some sense just see as a subgroup of this behavioral brand, and I'm you know, a proud card-carrying member of the behavioral economics um, whatever um, clan, um, but I'm going to separate it out. And um, so I don't know, to contrast with traditional behavioral, I chose biological, but really I just want to talk about experience effect. And here um, the emphasis is on humans' view of the world, so the beliefs they form about future outcomes being very strongly affected by realizations they personally experience, they personally live through. So it's not about not having the abstract learned knowledge, right? So people may learn information, they are kind of taught and so on, might be able to reproduce them in tests or you know, if, if, if they care enough about the grade. But, it's, but whenever they make decision, kind of the set of probabilities they go to is a different one. It's they have like some natural tendency, we all have some natural tendency to go to things that have personally affected us. We've lived through with emotions that are differently anchored in our brains. And that's something that's still missing in large parts of economics that we account more for this if you want brain plasticity, how trauma and scars alter us. And in particular that we economists recognize that this is independent of access to information and, and even cognitive capacities. You might be a highly skilled, uh, trained, um, high capacity, high ability person and still exhibit this behavior. And that's crucial. This is why I'm kind of singling it out because if you think about the remedies for these problems, um, they're somewhat different. So traditional approach, well, you know, if there are frictions, just improve access to information, generate certification system, come up with better mechanism design for people like to kind of reveal the information and come to the, you know, welfare improving trade. Behavioral, a lot is about, you know, well, okay, people make this mistake, so maybe we can teach them, right? If I see, I'm a finance professor, if I see people not invest in the stock market, a problem I'm going to get back to in a second, even though we all know we should invest in a broadly diversified low fee fund, no matter what, some of our, our savings, then I say, oh, I better explain them the equity premium puzzle and that the stock market is not so risky, like diversification, or maybe even the basics, base rule, or in, in, in fixed rate assets, interest rate compounding, and then it's fixed. Or maybe I'm a little more paternalistic and give them nudges. And so, right, these are the typical behavioral economics remedies once we realize it's not all about you know, access to information. But this is what I'm going to argue today is that this is not enough. I might be a perfectly informed, a highly capable, well-trained person and still having been scarred by some past trauma. I'm going to talk about the depression babies and them shying away from the stock market in a second. Me teaching them about the equity premium puzzle, um, that's not going to help it. So we need to undo the scarring. We need to undo the personal experiences and the remedy is therefore different. Maybe we want to design different experiences. We want to give people 50 or $100 to play with and try out for a year to invest in the stock market and see how they feel about it after a year. And that will be more powerful than them understanding the math. So that's kind of in a nutshell, the message. Let me give you two concrete COVID related examples. So one would be a very short term example. If you think about um, a reluctancy um, to get the vaccine and people having different views about the uh, effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccination, Right, so the traditional model would look at that and say, huh, we, um, we need to give people better information. Um, maybe we need better studies about long run effects and so on, but th that would kind of be the basic view. Behavioral economists would come in and say, well, maybe some people who, are, um, who have um, misguided beliefs about vaccines, they make some kind of math errors, right? They have like biases in their processing of information. So um, this argument of breakthrough cases proving that vaccines are useless and people, you know, maybe we need to kind of teach them better some statistics that are more relevant and that might help them to, to kind of understand um, why that's the wrong inference to draw. And what experience effects are about is to say, well, even a person who has understood this 
might alter their views and behavior after personally experiencing some realizations. So if you assume for a second, just Justin Trudeau and Boris Johnson were well informed about, I mean, that was maybe pre-vaccine, but like we're well informed about um, COVID, about the risk that the policy advisors have provided them with all the relevant information, then them still seeing that when, you know, uh, Trudeau's wife got infected early on or Boris Johnson had a scary moment in, in the hospital and then changing kind of their attitudes and their views about COVID-19. And I mean, the exam is not perfect because it was pre-vaccine, but um, that is kind of what, what, what I'm about here. And of course, this is just an example that's, you know, in the real world, ideology strategy may play a role. Um, but um, this is the kind of effect we have in mind with really highly informed people, even still putting different weight on realizations they have personally experienced or somebody close to them so it's differently anchored in their brain. And the result of that is that um, um, how your information, uh, you, how you get access to information under which circumstances um, will matter a lot for your long-run belief system and for your long-run choices. So the, the example before was a short-run example. Let me take more of a long-term example uh, next to kind of illustrate it. And then I go to the actual research. So let me stick to COVID-19 for a second. And um, let's kind of, you know, tally what economists have been working on ever since the um, COVID-19, the coronavirus hit. So there was, of course, immediately a lot of research of people trying to look at what the immediate impact of COVID is. Let's get access to cell phone data and let's see whether socially distancing and like, you know, like, let's do this kind of um, stuff. And so, yes, so that's important. There was some immediate impact. It's important to study with us being, you know, uh, at home. We have different types of interactions. Um, we have different interactions at work. Um, telemedicine emerged much more. Um, we're doing online shopping. Will we stick to online shopping? Uh, we are all using our yoga and hit ups to stay fit, even though, you know, we can't go and work out in the gym anymore. Um, as a finance person, I was super interested in seeing like more trading going on. Everybody, everyone is a day trader now. Wall Street Journal declared, you know, Robin Hood was trending on Twitter, etc. So that's, you know, ob the obvious thing economists like behavior would look at right away. Then when we start thinking about the longer term impact of the crisis, economists will start thinking about, um, you know, oh, what might be the impact on earnings and wealth? There's job loss, there are different educational choices. Um, schools change what they teach, they change admissions, who gets access to uh, education given that tests are being dropped, what role will vaccination requirements play, etc. But then what, when we are looking at what will happen in the long run, often you only see long run studies um, of or long run um, implications for different industries, for, for education, etc., which are revolving around circumstances having changed. So maybe an industry got disrupted or um, there's new science on, um, there's new technology, Zoom, which we will be using differently and hence the conference, uh, the ways conferences and congresses are done um, will change, et cetera. But what I'm interested in is the question whether living through the pandemic might have an impact on us above and beyond these changes. So even if we could do what economists love to do, ceteris paribus, hold everything else constant, let's say the pandemic is over, we are back to the life before the pandemic, our income is the same, our job situation, educational situation is the same, would we still be different people and look at the world differently, given that we lived through that? And that's the question I'm going to be asking in some sense today, not should that application, does the experience alter our beliefs and behavior in the long run? And how does that long run effect depend on, on personal exposure? So, um, be, be, uh, you know, when, whenever we are right into a, in a pandemic or epidemic, we, we might feel this very strongly. Oh, we're different people now. The world looks different. You know, we, from a mental health perspective, we might feel different and we might be able to see that. But then once it's over, um, often I think we tend to forget about it, even though there's a long history. Oops, I skipped one slide. Oh, no, it went away. Uh, okay, there's a, there, there's a long history of epidemics, or if you go back to the Black Death, um, um, if you go back more recently to, you know, um, HIV AIDS, uh, about um, the, the so-called Spanish flu, the influenza, where 
if we now look at the history textbooks, I mean, they acknowledge that these kind of crises, these kind of pandemics did have a strong impact that they affected, I mean, black death, population structures, um, 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 trade patterns, um, that they're as important as wars and political decisions, but that they also changed something else, namely the beliefs, like how people looked at the world, that often gets forgotten. And this a research agenda on experience effects tries to bring this back. So if I can just have one historical slide here on the impact of the black, black death on beliefs. Um, of course, um, you know, it changed medical beliefs. Um, it, it was kind of interesting. You might have seen this kind of costume at, at Halloween. People start realizing, well, maybe it touches differently to different surfaces. So let me wear leather or I might need masks, you know, even funny looking masks as this doctor there. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about um, that uh, a, a crisis, an epidemic, um, changed actually also worldviews. So what um, historians say today is that the uh, Black Death significantly altered religious beliefs, a new piety and cult of plague saints evolved. And back in Germany, we have these passion plays in Oberammergau every 10 years happening this year, which, which came from, from that period. And the modern theodicy discussion um, really started evolving at this time. Frank Snowden, a Yale researcher who um, has a book and some famous lectures on epidemics and society talks about um, the result of black death, not so much being uh, atheism uh, um, as a mute despair. Something that with some anachronism one might call post-traumatic stress um, from, from today's perspective. And it is this kind of rewiring of our brain, different system of us how we are using information and form beliefs and then make decisions about our lives and other people's lives, which I'm interested in and we're trying to bring to today. So what I'm gonna try um, it was, it was two main examples, stock market and inflation uh, in the rest of the time of today is to try and contrast traditional economic thinking and even much of the behavioral economic think thinking, which wouldn't make a difference between you know, people personally experiencing a pandemic or a crisis versus having all the data available and being able to draw inferences um, about what a pandemic and crisis can do to you. The effect of living through a depression on financial investment should in traditional economic models be no different than um, um, reading about it. Having personally experienced unemployment, having grown up in poverty, having seen your parents lose your job or you yourself having lost your job or not gotten the desired job on the tenure track early on, should be no difference from knowing about the probabilities of that happening to you in traditional economic models. And then of course, living through a pandemic should not affect um, um, your decision-making any different from knowing about the likelihoods and implications. And so this is where experience effects come in and say, no, there are long lasting effects on beliefs and behavior. You can call them scarring effects. Um, one of my colleagues at Econ, uh, Pat Klein tends to call this work we are doing econ PTSD, which is not too bad. I'm gonna talk more about trauma in a second. And in some sense, it links quite nicely with what we know today about neuroplasticity and, and rewiring. Okay, so first example is the stock market. As Mike said, I work a lot with finance data. And it actually started from um, my co-author, Stefan Nagel, who's also German, which will play a role later, and I learning about depression babies, this notion that people who have lived through the Great Depression in the US, apparently being scarred by these kind of headlines and, and living through it, um, were as a result shying away from the stock market and all things risky, like the plague for the, for the rest of their lives. So we looked into the literature and found nobody had actually doc documented. Yeah, question? There's another question. These like scarring experiences, I understand are you focusing on because i think of these as phenomena that happen like at societal level like depression babies or people who live through black plague it's like describes like a large swath of society versus things like you know if a family member suffered a tragic death that might change your attitude towards like seat belts so this is like are you looking at both or one or yeah like, so so excellent question thanks for stopping me so i have in mind um the latter in some sense, it's like the personal experience and it can be idiosyncratic. It can be somebody in my family who died in a car accident. Of course, it can be correlated with what's happening to society, right? So if there's a black death, well, chances are that in my family too, uh, somebody is dying at this point in time. But really the, the original meaning of it is about the personal experience, like you as a person or maybe somebody really close, um, close to you. 
Now, the reason why I'm talking a lot about more aggregate macro level crisis is um, I need in the data some good, big identifiable shock, right? And so I get it that way. And also, ideally, I want it to be um, orthogonal to anything else unobserved about you. Because of, say, if in my family, people are particularly likely to die from car accidents, it might be correlated with our general attitudes towards risk or not being taught well, like about driving and so on. And so when it's like a macro shock, it's often nice that it gives me this exogeneity I want, but really I'm about the latter. So if I only had better data and you know, you guys might have ideas about that and can control for unobservables that might be correlated, that would be much closer to what I have in mind. So I'm going to talk now about depression babies. And, yeah. yeah. Hold on, just to follow up on that. So if, can I think of it that if you have this macro shock, if you believe it's personal anyhow, it's sort of more of a natural experiment because I can think of the macro environment more random. And so what I really see is your experience that if it would be something with a small family, it's very unclear what the correlation was causation. That, that, that's perfect, exactly. That's a good way of putting it just with this slight addition that when it's a macro shock, I would still ideally want to identify, did that macro shock affect you personally? And maybe it did not affect you. And do I see a stronger impact on you versus you? The macro shock is this coin flip, which is on the exterior. Exactly. You want to ideally observe what I'm seeing. Exactly. Now I might not be able to, so hence, I might just go back that both of you lived through the Great Depression. Well, you didn't, but like, you know, had this well financial crisis. Let's maybe close up pandemic. And so now I'm going to look. It's kind of like a you know like an instrument, if if that makes sense. Yeah, like like uh, like I like use it as an instrument and then look at kind of your average outcome and take into account that it will be somewhat you know weakened in in terms of the effect I can measure. Does that make sense? So so very much along those the lines of that discussion. If before you do anything interesting with the data, if you just try to get data on stock market investment, here's the extensive margin. So do people invest at least invest at least one dollar in the stock market? A little bit controlling for age. I'm looking at people mid thirties to mid forties, and I'm looking at it by cohorts. Cohorts born up to 1920, 21 to 30, 31 to 40, and so on and so forth in ten year intervals. Then. For starters, I mean, there's a general upward trend, you know, some of that teaching about the equity premium puzzle is hopefully and diversification is working out and people invest more in the stock market. But the participation that experienced the Great Depression, the, the generation that experienced the Great Depression as teenagers, young adults, have with 13% stock market participation um, a rate that is like less than half of any later generation. So that's interesting. And then you see it go up and kind of have a first peak for the 31 to 40 generation that experienced the post-World War II boom, this US data I should have said, uh, post-World War bo uh, uh, boom during their young adult life. Um, and then you see it kind of dip again in the 41 to 50 cohort, which experienced as they, you know, reached that age, the, you know, depression years of the 1970s, stagflation, et cetera. So, there is something going on. So how could we test that more generally? So the approach we, we chose um, was the following, that we said, well, financial researchers have found a lot of highly predictive variables that you know, explain who's investing in the stock market or not. And let's stick to the extensive margin, but same on the intensive margin, how much of your liquid assets do you have in the stock market? So it's your income, your wealth, your education, family status, you can throw in race, ethnicity, et cetera. So there are all these variables, and let's say they're captured in some, you know, vector X. And then we ask, what if in addition, we throw in a variable that tries to capture your lifetime exposure to the stock market. Now, I didn't have this perfect data I would like to have, like you personally, did you have a portfolio? How did your portfolio go? Um, even if I had it, I would have endogeneity problems. I want to have this exogenous coin flip. Like if you invest more in the stock market than me, maybe you are better informed about the stock market with different attitudes. So I'm just going to use how the S&P 500 or some other broad-based stock market index did during your lifetime so far. 
Do you happen to be born in a time when it was mostly crashing and all you get is bad news, like say the Great Depression? Or did you happen to, in your life so far, mostly live through times where the news was always, whoa, the DAX, uh, sorry, that's Germany, the, the, the S&P 500 reaches new heights, uh, et cetera, I, I exposed to those kind of news. And I'm gonna summarize them in some variable, which is basically the weighted sum of past experiences. I'm gonna talk more about what I did there in a second because I think there's much more to, to be done there in particular with tools, people in this room may know much better than me. But um, let's just think about it just kind of as the, you know, the average of what happened to the stock market over your life so far. So if you're 30 years old, it's the last 30 years. If it's 50 years old, it's the last 50 years and so on and so forth. And then let's do the usual thing, you know, let's use um, maximum likelihood to kind of predict who's kind of investing in the stock market in this private estimation. Um, where as usual, I'm estimating some coefficients on, 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 on these explanatory variables. I'm also simultaneously estimating a lambda, which I explained in a second, which determines how much weight I would put on what periods in my life. And then I'm gonna relate, uh, for example, lifetime experience on the stock market to stock market investment. I can do that in any other market. I also did with bond market and bond market investment and, and so on. And to anticipate the results, we found that your personal history of exposure to the stock market has really strong, I mean, economically large, not only statistically significant predictive power in terms of your stock market participation. So um, in this um, time period I'm looking at here, which is basically almost data from the last hundred years, we use the SCF as a survey of consumer finance. Um, the US has great data, not quite the panel I would like, it's repeated cross-section, but you can go back to the forties and even you know, take into account earlier experiences. Um, over, let's say, the last 100 years, um, the average stock market participation was around uh, 36%. And if I now look at the uh, interdecile range of somebody who at a certain point in their life um, was at the 10th percentile of stock market experience. So she was born at a time and the stock market was crashing and things were not good. All she's seen is bad news. And I compare her to a person who's at the 90th percentile, right? Happened to be at a good times, born at the right time and seen mostly good news about um, stock market realizations. The predicted difference in investment, in, in, sorry, in the likelihood of investing in the stock market is 14 percentage points. So, you know, a third to a half um, compared to the 37% baseline. And very similar to bond holdings. So they are also the average uh, bond market participation is 37% over that period. And the interdecile range effect is 15 percentage point. What is super interesting for economists, at least, is that there's no cross fertilization pretty much. So what I experienced in one asset market, you know, there's of course a whole variance, covariance matrix of how, you know, these things are related and I should be updating. That doesn't seem to happen much. My experience in the stock market affects what I do in the stock market, bond market and the bond market. And it's this kind of interesting separation which economists have a really hard time handling because we like to think about you having global risk preferences and utility functions and so on. Now, what exactly did I do and to take into account past experiences? I did something a little brute force, which I think uh, definitely I hope can be improved. I basically wanted to have some kind of weighting function that would allow me with just one parameter to capture your lifetime exposure. And I wanted to account for some people having longer lifetime histories and other people having shorter lifetime histories. So, I mean, we literally came up with this function. So, so this A I had before, right, is the weighted average of all the previous returns of the stock market over your lifetime so far. Time T is now, K is the lag. I'm going back from today to your birth year. And then we came up with this function of take your current age minus K the lag to the lambda. And then, of course, normalize it to go, go back to, to one. So what that gives you is a function that, depending on what lambda you're estimating, you know, for lambda equal to zero, it would be equal weighting throughout your lifetime. So I have a hypothetical 50-year-old person here today going back to birth. If I come up with lambda equal to one, it would be linearly declining weight. It could also be, you know, early impressions matter most, right? Like a negative lambda, early, um, lot of weight of early on. And um, yeah, so, so you can have kind of, you can, can shift around the weights. We also experimented with hump shape and U-shaped. I'm not showing that here. Of course, in reality, we think, um, it's, it's probably more interesting, it's different. Like we have learned from neurobiology about formative periods, sensitive periods, how they vary also by gender, and how they vary differently by gender, pre and post puberty, pre and post menopause. It's something I'm studying with my biologists right now. And so really you would want to do some, 
you know, it's not even deep learning, some like shallow learning of like feeding in like, right, the, 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 the time series of like exposure and kind of figure out better ways to fit it. Well, that's what we did for now. And what we came up with, and it's super interesting what, what we found over and over again in the stock market and the bond market. Um, I've looked at unemployment experiences. I've looked at um, inflation experiences. We came up with something, the data was always telling us that something close to lambda equal to one would give you the best fit. It's a little bit steeper, actually, sometimes more like lambda equal to three, but roughly linearly declining weight. So you put a lot of weight on what happened recently, recency bias, I mean, we knew that. But even stuff way back early on can get a lot of weight and affect you for the rest of your life if the shock was only strong enough. So that's what was this kind of um, functional form we kept finding, and that's what I used for the economic magnitude I, I, I showed you before. Um, I'm sure the economists <laughs> would say, I mean, those economists, that, you know, I mean, there is a you, you can rewrite it as something that discounts stuff in the in the past differently than today, right? That that may be part of what my weights are picking up. Okay, um, just I mean to hone home why we think this is important. Um, I, I totally raced through like a whole paper or two in a, in a moment here, but if you believe me for a second that it is true that our lifetime exposure to, in this case, stock market realizations affects how we think about the stock market. And then as a result, whether or not we invest in the stock market and how much. And you apply this to the whole US population, not just the people I have in the survey of consumer finances. So you go to the census, get the whole US population, maybe restricted to people 25 to 75, or what you think is relevant age for kind of investment in the stock market and say, let's assume Ulrike is right. And everybody does experience-based learning, right? Everybody, when they're making a decision, they're putting this extra weight on stuff they've personally experienced in their life. And let's take the parameters she, parameters she estimate, the coefficient estimates she used. And then let's calculate the average, oh, here below this, the average experience returns for the whole US population. And you can weigh them by liquidity or wealth if you want, not too much changes. Then you get these red bars. So basically the returns people have experienced over their lifetime so far. So some of the variation comes from stock market ups and downs, and some of it comes from demographics. Are there more young people who've only experienced 20 years and older people who've experienced the last 80 years, right? I'm kind of averaging all these people to get these red bars. So plot it over time. Um, in the original paper, we stopped at 2006, but we've actually extended it to 2020 now. Um, and then I plot the price earnings ratio, meaning, um, um, so that goes back to, to Bob Schiller. So, so price earnings ratio is what's the price on which a stock is traded um, divided by the earnings they're actually generating that year. If that ratio is really high, we think people are really excited about the stock market right now, right? They're trading it at a high rate. And also we think actually future returns are likely to <laughs> not be, be so good, so predictive of negative future returns. So I'm plotting here the, in blue, the price earning ratios. I mean, here's the scale for the price earnings ratio. You do need to do a lot of econometrics to see that these are highly correlated. So what I'm trying to get at, I mean, it's totally back of the envelope admittedly, is that taking into account lifetime experience of the whole population gives you some pretty good measure of the level of stock market valuation overall. I should say I applied the price earnings ratio to the whole US stock market here. So it seems to really aggregate up and possibly help to uh, understand how markets are moving, how prices are moving in markets, in this case, like the stock, uh, the stock market. It also helps you, sorry, this looks a little more noisy, uh, to predict who is present in the stock market. So often we tend to think about as economists about life cycle things. So maybe early on, you're not in the stock market and then later you're more and then um, as you're going to retirement, maybe you want to get away from the vol volatility of the stock market and invest in some other assets. And I mean, that's true, they're life cycle effects, but they're also experience effects. So if you plot the difference in stock market participation between old minus young here is above 60 minus below 40. So what, 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 he, what we used here. And you plot it against, I'm sorry, can I get rid of this black thing? But in any case, it, it says here difference in experience between old minus young as well. Um, you do tend to get a positive correlation, meaning when people who are right now six years above over their lifetime so far 
have on average had pretty good experience with the stock market relative to the younger people. More of the older generations are represented in the stock market, are participants. At times, you know, right after boom times, when maybe young people have seen nothing but good news, the older people have also seen other times, 87, financial crisis, and so on. Then it's the older, the younger people who are overrepresented. So who is present in a market, the composition of who's participating can also be predicted uh, with experience effects. And um, you can do, once you assume this, you can do a lot of stuff. You can embed this experience-based learning in equilibrium models of asset markets. Um, we economists love these overlapping generation models where finitely lived agents come in and go out, uh, are born and, and die, assume some kind of standard uh, preferences, and then work with this persistent heterogeneity in beliefs, something e economists traditionally really don't like. They want that if you feed more information, we are converging to the same beliefs. But experience effects prevent that because we all have different lifetime experiences and there will always be kind of this wedge. And so then you can generate these implications for market composition, as I just showed you. You can generate implications for trade volume, um, for example. So whenever the um, uh, whenever uh, the, the level of disagreement changes between two courts, that should lead to higher or, or lower um, a trade volume. So can I still? No? OK, so for example, um, that's from, from a different paper with Biko um, Vanasco and my colleague Damien Puzo at, 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 at the Econ department. If I plot um, trade volume as the deviation of the turnover ratio in stocks from the trend, I mean, there's a strong upward trend, which I took out here. Um, I get the blue line from going from the 80s to recently. And if I plot that against the standard deviation of experiences, so meaning that, um, you know, depending on recent realizations of returns, sometimes older and younger generations maybe have the same average lifetime experience. Sometimes they're further away, sometimes they get closer. And whenever they should get further away, you should see more trade volume. You trade on differences in beliefs due to, um, to, to this new information coming in. And I don't know how well visible it is, but you know, the orange, the, 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 the blue line are pretty closely related, meaning you can, uh, explain also who's trading with whom in the market based on personal experience, whether which generation wants to sell more, which one reacts strongly to negative news, which one reacts less strongly, etc. So there, there are many other um, applications in, you know, who invests in IPOs, um, mortgage choices, fixed rate versus variable rate, we're all taking too much fixed rate in general, um, uh, buy versus rent decision, consumption spending and unemployment experiences, which can use this feature, uh, international capital flows, stuff like home bias and so on, can really be understood much better once we account for experience effects. But I just wanted to, um, that I don't have much time left, take first a moment to kind of summarize the features which seem to be emerging from this literature and then talk about one more application in inflation, if, 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 if that's okay, um, which is what we seem to be learning is that personal exposure in our lifetime so far seems to have a long lasting effect on our beliefs and resulting choices. Um, different cohorts, even if they have the exact same information set available to them, will make different decisions depending on what they've personally lived through in their life. These experience effects are domain specific. So differently from traditional economics, there will be no cross fertilization between different realms um, um, as we would generally predict with like more global utility functions. The extent of the exposure matters whether I've had really hard, hit really hard or, or less hard. Um, so for example, thinking about COVID-19, if uh, different genders, if different races uh, were carrying the burden differently of living through this pandemic, we expect persistent differences years after, even when you might say, What's the problem? Everything is how it was before. But um, so these uh, differences will persist, which may interact with inequality. And I mean, most puzzling to, I think, economists at least, this should affect even experts who are fully informed about the underlying information. So that's the crassest way of formulating the prediction. So to, to illustrate that, let me use the uh, example of inflation. So if you apply um, what I just told you about the stock market to inflation, that's, you know, it was a boring topic until a few years ago, but I think currently everybody is somewhat interested in that topic. Um, and then what you've personally experienced in your lifetime's finance inflation will have lingering effects for years and decades after 
on how much you worry about prices and you know possibly your investment and, and your decisions. And it's certainly, I got interested in the topic, as I said, with my German course at Stefan Nagel, because I grew up with these types of pictures and history textbooks about the German hyperinflation and kids playing with bundles of worthless rice mark. Um, but here in the US, we had a period, I mean, it's much discussed in the press now, in 1980, where Paul Volcker, the then Fed chairman, was really worried about how can he convince people that he can do it, that he can come back to price stability? And he said it really nicely. He said there's a generation of young adults who's growing up seeing nothing by inflation, about inflation. How can I convince them that I will be able to return back? That's exactly what we're after. He understands it's not about teaching them how smart they are, whether they can do math, whether they understand monetary policy. It's like they've seen nothing but, and it will be really hard. And let me skip that. <laughs> um, and if you try to look at the data on inflation beliefs, you see that Paul Volcker was right. So what I'm showing you here, let me take a second to explain that, is um, our best data or longer, longest lasting data on inflation beliefs is the Michigan Survey of Consumers. And among other things, they ask people, um, what do you think inflation will be over the next year? And then people give their answer, including some crazy answers. So you better correct for some outliers or you take the, some averages and so on. And what I'm plotting here is not the answer to this question, but the demeaned answer. So this data starts in the 50s, and in every single year, I just subtract the population average. And then I'm plotting your answer, I mean, people's answer, in bins to make it a little bit visible, below 40 black, uh, 40 to 60 red, and above 60 blue. Okay, so if I hadn't done the demeaning, you would see, so 1980 was peak inflation, you would see everybody going up in their inflation beliefs and then coming down. So I'm taking out that average because I want to see the cross-sectional differences. And so what I see is, okay, sometimes the young are more pessimistic, sometimes the older generations during the peak inflation was particularly the young, but then, you know, it kept reversing back and forth. And the differences are large. So macroeconomists, running these models where they're just trying to pr predict what mean inflation beliefs are, median inflation beliefs are, they miss a lot because sometimes the difference as big as three percentage points in beliefs systematically, in this case, the younger people are more pessimistic than the older ones. So now if you do the same thing we did before with the stock market, you say, well, let me try to predict their beliefs, not just using our usual updating of an AR1 process, like uh, you know, estimates of the coefficients in AR1 process as we do with inflation data, roughly follows that pattern. But let's throw in also their lifetime experience of inflation. And so at this point, for example, the young people have seen nothing but inflation, right, for a couple of years. And the older people have also seen, you know, times before. And so if you, if you run this model, similar to the one I showed you before, just using an AR1, if you can bear with me, and you plot the fitted values, pretty nice, actually. I mean, not perfect, but you do get... The, the young can be more pessimistic and the old, you get the two peaks, mid 70s, mid 80s. It's, it's actually, you get all the stuff which was missing from traditional macro models. You at least directionally get it. I mean, I wish I had you know, gotten the peaks better and here I'm overshooting a little bit. So there's definitely stuff to be improved. Remember, I'm, I'm, I'm forcing it into this weighting function, this one parameter weighting function still, that could be part of it, but really helpful. But then what's really interesting is, it really seems to work even for FOMC members. So Federal Open Market Committee is these you know, Fed governors and uh, regional presidents who decide about the, the rates and how they respond to in inflation. So whenever there's news about uh, the Fed having you know, raised or lowered rates or not done anything, it's those people. So I was wondering, could I explain even their behavior? Right. And these, as far as I'm concerned, are people who have all the inflation data available to them. They have a big staff who calculates models for them, et cetera. And so um, for starters, um, there's a really cool uh, anecdote I can't stop myself from sharing, which is a German guy born as Heinrich Wallich in, in Berlin in 1914 to a family of bankers, lived through Germany's hyperinflation, emigrated to the US, became a Fed governor and became Henry Wallach now. And then kept dissenting in the FOMC me me meetings about people being too lax on inflation, that rates have to be risen. Nobody understands how terrible inflation is and that it's just around the corner. So, so that's a really cool example, right? Somebody personally having lived to like high inflation, another country, another time. That's a smart guy. He got a PhD later, I think from Harvard. He worked in the Fed system. And I like, I mean, he understands stuff and still he couldn't shake it. You know, he couldn't shake it. He kept worrying about inflation. But it's not only him. So if you plot, for example, the 
twice a year, um, the FOMC members forecast what they think inflation will be over next year and it's reported in the semi-annual monetary policy reports to Congress. If you plot what they say there <laughs> against their personal lifetime experience of inflation, and of course, I have much less variation to work with here. You know, and recently this used to be all, you know, white men of a certain age, and now there's some women and there are some younger people. I don't have a lot of variation to work with, but still get a really nice positive um, uh, relationship. So personal experiences go in, uh, infiltrate what they say, what they think about inflation. And in fact, it even affects their decisions. So here I'm showing graphs of um, the probability of dissent, of people uh, voting against what the Fed chairperson proposes as the race or so on. Davish dissent says, oh, no, don't worry so much about inflation. Let's keep about unemployment. Hawkish dissent are, no, inflation is terrible. Let's raise rates. And so in general, people don't dissent too much. You know, it's about 2 to 4%. But if I increase your lifetime experience of inflation by just you know one standard deviation which is really little in this very homogeneous group it's 0.1 percentage point i get a reduction in dovish descent by a third and one increase in hawkish descent by a quarter right all right um so it seems to matter even for the x plus um let me skip a couple of slides i because i'm out of time here on um on the uh, underlying neuroscience that relates to it but let me just say one more thing in before I get to the conclusion side, which is, um, I think I a lot about crises like pandemic, German hyperinflation, uh, the Great Great Depression, uh, etc. And um, as, as you guys discussed very well, these are nice, rather exogenous natural experiments for me to do. So I would feel a little bad, but my team is doing believe in that stuff happened. But I do want to point out that it's not only these big shocks. It, it, I mean, first of all, it's also idiosyncratic shocks. I wish I had better data on those, as, as you said, but also it can, it can be smaller shocks. You know, you know it's um, very similar to the trauma literature. Uh, if you talk to a neuropsychiatrist, they always get worked up about us thinking trauma is just these big shocks. They say the daily slide, the daily Peter cuts, the daily assumptions that are made about war, and uh, that, that can be as generated as big of the trauma as, 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 as the big shocks of uh, war experiences, adverse childhood experiences, etc. So, so in economic terms, daily worry about food price and food insecurity, price, um, price, and price in general, unemployment, etc. can very stabilize back. And, and they do translate also into this type of behavior. So my, so my, my, my last example here is, here is um, again and again in inflation. Um, for decades, I have this understanding that my women always had higher inflation expectations as men. Who can go decades that they act back, they have bad papers about that. And you're wondering, are women inherently more pessimistic? Or is it, is it, is it financial education? Is it different like this? Like this? Um, in a, in a survey, survey I read mixed with, 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 with Okay, let's find all the relevant variables. 
the future. Exactly. It is, it is, exactly. No, no, I think that setting is actually a very good setting um, to think about it. I'm wondering whether there's anything. Um, yeah, so, you know, the contrast to that is that like traditional economic thinking would be, well, but if I now present you with data on what happened to thousand other people who made maybe different initial choices and what were the outcomes they, they, they encountered, what that would be, that would affect your behavior. And I would say, no, no, you stick to your own uh, one unbounded world and like and keep updating based on that. I mean, you're not stupid. You might, if I do, again, if I do a test with you, you might be able to produce the right variables. But, you know, in the moment when you have to make the decision, do I put more on the stock market or not? It will be that personal, your personal uh, bended word will which come back to you. That's a very good way of framing what I presented today. Was there anything that you learned that doesn't lead over at other aspects of your life in your data? So, you know, do I... Do I become cautious in general, or, or is it all just kind of the specific domains? Because that kind of makes some sense to me. It, it's action oriented. I figure out what are my choices in a given domain, and then I adjust the weights on those over time. And that has nothing to do with some other domain where I have to run a banded algorithm as well. There's no kind of transfer. But did you see a transfer? In some I mean, examples? I mean, to be completely honest, of course I was after the non-transfers, right? Because like economists would be like, no, if it's correlated, it will translate into your beliefs. And I was after showing that this is not the case. Um, so I can't like really claim I have the full world. I mean, so, I mean, stuff like inflation experiences, how you think about interest rates, whether you buy or rent a house, conditional on buying a house, whether you do a fixed rate or variable rate mortgage. I mean, these are all related, but this is, I mean, this is pretty close to each other anyhow. So this is why I'm still calling it a domain specific. But, um, you know, risk attitude in, uh, you talked about the accident, the car accident. So maybe um, the person will be now more careful in putting the seat belt and so on. But um, seeing that translate into more careful financial investment is, uh, I mean, I haven't tested exactly that, but that kind of link 
uh, which economists, if they had updated all in terms of your risk attitudes, would immediately infer we don't we don't find in the data so far. I mean, with the caveat of we don't have perfect data. Uh, so you saw that, like, I guess younger people had different kinds of priors and different strengths of priors compared to older people in these situations. Did you find that, like, the straight, like, people with very strong um, prior experience uh, beliefs, like, did you find that that actually led to more accurate, like, uh, or, or better decisions that, like, ended up better for them on the long run? Or was it the people who had, like, the weaker priors that had better decisions? Yeah, so... Um, you have to be careful to, 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 to speak more too generally because, for example, in the stock market, a simple means model is probably good uh, to think about stock market return. In, in the inflation world, it would be more an AR1 process or a seasonal AR4 process. So, like, you have to be a little, you know, how persistent should, how, how, how much would anchoring matter and so on matter, varies a bit. But broadly speaking, yeah, I mean, the encouraging thing as, you know, I'm getting older is that it seems to say there's some wisdom with age. I mean, in some sense, right, you're taking a longer time series more actively into account. Now, at every given moment, the younger generation can still be better, right? So for, if there was a, a structural break, of course, the older generation will be stuck in that pre-structural break world. Um, or if just the recent um, returns reflect very nicely, like where the market is heading, but in general, um, you, the, the longer you've lived, the more data you're putting this extra weight on, and that's generally speaking good. And then also, um, you see that the younger generation overacts a lot to recent shocks. So, right, so if you are born into, um, if you graduate from college and it's the financial crisis or it's COVID-19, right, that's all you've seen so far. That's how you think about your employment chances or what will happen if you invest. And so you're hugely distorted while older generations react to it, but they've seen other times and like taking that into account. So they don't have these strong over and under reactions. So I'm a little bit overgeneralizing, but that's the flavor. Good question, yeah. based on the past yeah something like the lambda value in that familiar language the yeah yeah but like i still don't understand how that would help me so like so there are the decisions like in your example we just said the stock market and the bond market or something and then so what will happen with the other types of decisions why does it translate into the lambda i didn't get that uh, like i'm just saying you know, like Mm -hmm. And somehow you like compare them to the rest of the stock market, mm -hmm. and you rate them uh, based like using the lambda value. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm just saying, like that could be one way to predict the market. That sounds nice. Yeah. I, I was. Yeah, I guess I was arguing the opposite, or mm -hmm. suggesting the opposite that uh, we seem context-free. We're just doing a banded algorithm for the stock market and the bond market, and we're doing another one over here. Context is what gives you a sharing and, and kind of I so I, there's not a lot of sharing going on between the uh, situations. So, so are you using context like the same as domain or differently from domain? Uh, well, like somebody was using it and I've been switching a bit a little bit. I called like I called our decisions by being very domain specific. It's like what I see in the stock market applies to the stock market, bond market applies to the bond market. How are we using context right now? Yeah, I suppose like it depends on how. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm not like saying anything very particular. Yeah, it's just nice. But yeah, I, I suppose like the context could interfere like between the attitudes. Okay, so you are using it as different from domain. Okay, so um, um, sorry, there, there's some vocabulary confusion um, here. So um, if you talk to brain researchers and your scientists and so on, they like to use context very similar to what I'm being calling domain. Some of them, the psychologists call it domain. But um, um, so, so you see, in fact, in a lot of recent uh, literature on memory, that word, the context matter as something like economists haven't taken into account. But um, 
but you were going towards the connection to other decision making realms, right? And uh, okay, so yeah, I'm not sure about that. So I, I said, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure where you're heading with that, but I did want to put point out that, um, for example, Bob Schiller, like one of our famous novel laureates whom I cited earlier on the price earnings ratio, he is all about narratives these days. He thinks what economics is missing is narratives, that we have narratives of what inflation is about or what the stock market is, is, is about, et cetera. And I, I think he and I are interested in the same thing. Like we are, people have a story in mind of like what this data represents and um, it triggers some reaction. So, so I definitely see the link to narratives. I'm not entirely sure what to do with the narratives of trauma survivor, tra tra traumatized people uh, you are mentioning. Are you suggesting this is data one could use? Yeah. Yeah. No, I so um yeah, so 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 two things. So one is, I mean, I skipped the neuroplasticity slides and and then so ultimately I'm calling it experience effect or that resonates and so on. In some sense, I would love to see if we were able to do that now, like you know, something happens. How is it anchored in, in your brain? How strong is the synapse between these two neurons fire? And is the synapse tagged? Is it like there's some long-term potentiation? I would really love to measure that. And maybe there is data or qualitative data which, which would speak to that. But then also you were asking, are they really thinking about this past experience? So, so in some sense, my story would be like a depression baby, somebody who's lived through the Great Depression and, and has had this fear the moments of fear and des desperation, as soon as they hear today, stock market, the S&P 500, blah, blah, they hear stock market, fear is triggered, right? I would like to have data that shows that. And um, I think there is this type of data people generate. It's a little bit like in the Bond movies, <laughs> right? When James Bond is tested and they throw words at him, like job. And then he has to cover, what does job mean to He has to say killing or like, which they have to see whether he functions the way they, they, they want him to function, right? These kind of tests. I, apparently that's real science, not just in the bond. And so doing something like this, I don't know whether that's what you have in mind. So, so like for so stock market and hear whether fear, uncertainty, volatility, whether they say that, those words or the words um, equity premium, no, that's what, I, what finance process is dreaming of, but like returns, uh, earning or something would be interesting and then maybe even more specifically yours. So I would love to have data that could hone in on this really being going on, but I haven't found it yet. If you know literature that tries to do something along those lines, I would love to. Yeah, just one, as a back, person with a background in psychology, I, I kind of want to push back a little bit about yeah. these sort of fear and trauma things. So I, um, I mean, humans learn all kinds of things. Like if, you know, if you, uh, the Stroop effect, you know, if you write the, uh, words in certain colors, you write the red word and it's in a green color, I can't say the word, it's mm -hmm. much, much slower at all. It's not because I had a trauma, it's because I had an experience back when. I think you could also do similarly, uh, the kind of experience you're talking about with diet, with foods. So do I like spicy food? You know, well, yeah, I do. And it's because I had a long-term, I had a great experience back when and that lasts for the rest of my life and mm -hmm. other people don't. And, and those aren't, you could say, well, it's a trauma when you ate spicy food and you 
your, your eyes water, but it's, it's just an experience, right? So why does it have to be the word trauma? Yeah, you know, no, that, that, and, you know, fear and, and, and giddiness and all enhance, perhaps they turn up the, the learning rate on the by the dollar. No, that has to be kind of fear trauma. You know, no, no. So, so, so this is true. So, so in fact, I mean, maybe I can just put on, on, on the slides. Like I, um, I don't want to be all about, didn't I have, where's the, where did I, oh, maybe I can just put page up. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so it's not necessarily about trauma. It just turns out that reading the trauma literature has been the most helpful to me. Like reading about, I don't know, somebody comes back from war and when he, they hear cars starting, a car noise, hide under the table. It's, I don't have to give them more information that there's no bomb coming down here. And so that, that this stuff won't help or like teach them to update. It's just some automaticity and it affects even highly educated, well-informed people. So this is why the trauma literature has been so helpful. But really what we are after is to try to draw a difference between the way economists have draw, uh, thought about stimuli coming in, updating of information, and um, what we know about neuroplasticity that are the pathways, the connections we are creating are changing in response to learning experience, memory foundation, exactly as you were saying, Mike, you'd write a good experience with something related to spicy food early in your life. And, and this kind of just persisted. And then also what we learn again, still not trauma necessarily, is that um, repeated um, um, stimulation matters, prolonged uh, stimulation matters. So this concept of long-term potentiation, which there's research on since the late um, 90s uh, of how this kind of automaticity can survive for a long time um, is kind of what I want to bring into economics. Now, the literature on trauma in some sense is, an, is a very illustrative, good example of it. I do think that we economists should embrace that word a bit more. For example, when we are thinking about food insecurity, unemployment, and so on, but it's not all about that. I, I completely agree. Maybe one more question. Alex? <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I was curious about the uh, sort of thought that uh, Mike brought up about like, you know, having there being some sort of like learning process that's like sort of, that can be sort of applied universally. Okay. And that people like perhaps people like apply like the same learning process to like you know all different sorts of uh, environments without like um, and because like something like this is like universal whereas like you know if, if you want to apply like uh, like if you want to be like fully Asian then you have to like take into account all the data like it's, yeah like, a very specific thing to like different um, different domains yeah. And so I'm wondering how people try to measure like whether like yeah so I was I was actually thinking about this slide and whether for example like people like maybe like people have like the same lambda for like different environments if you like think about this lambda as like Ooh. specific okay so I haven't done that what I was wanted to pro proudly repeat here <laughs> which is not quite what you're asking for is that I get pretty similar lambdas across different domains so it's always somewhere around lambda equal to one, maybe slightly higher. Again, still some caveats, should I be working with that function to begin with? Maybe we can we can do better, but it, like whether I look at inflation experience, I look at stock market experience, I look at unemployment experiences um, in the international context and kind of more broadly capital flows and, 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 and crisis, it always seems to be of that nature of, you know, some recency bias, but it's not that, that you know, economists, when they do over inference, they typically say we put too much weight on one or two years and then that stops and everybody does it the same way. They don't have like a 50 year old person as long and the 20 year old person has much steeper uh, results. And so that um, is pretty amazing that it looks kind of universal. I, I, I carefully say, like, you know, you're saying even within person. And so that I haven't had the opportunity to test um, and I'm I'm like a little nervous about it. I don't know, but I would love to know. That's a good question, yeah. Okay, thanks. We could probably go on forever. So oh, know. me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. Thanks. thanks for a great question. So this research I did is also kind of like changing the focus of the intervention that you would try yes. to do to fix yeah. the problem. Thanks. Uh, sorry we didn't get to your question. Email me. We can have lunch. <laughs> I 
as yeah. you were mentioning uh, at the very beginning when you're contrasting with like behavioral or like the traditional approaches in economics. So I was curious, it seems like you've had a lot of, kind of collaborations with, like people in other fields and I was wondering what what were the kinds of interventions that would change like Wallach's mind when it came to like, that like, would like, change like that someone like Wallach's like you know, Wallach, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he got a PhD he was trained as an expert he saw he was been around for a long time but yeah he, had, he was like very hawkish like he always yes. thought that inflation would happen right yeah. like you know it seems like formal training may or may not always like correct this like what is the yeah thing that like you know would be 